Mama, take it away. Meet the hosts, OJ Ajayfia, former former but with you, Winnie Fred Iwanigo, and Joma Mwapa. Welcome to today's edition of Oche Kitchen Discussions. As you already know, today's topic is um, slavery in Africa. A brief history of slavery that you didn't learn in school. In the 15th century, the Roman Catholic Church divided the world in half, granting Portugal a monopoly on trade in West Africa and Spain the right to colonize the new world in its quest for land and gold. Pope Nicholas V borrowed Portuguese efforts and issued the Romanus Pontifex of 1455, which affirmed Portugal's exclusive rights to territories it claimed along the West African coast and the trade from those areas. It granted the right to invade plunder, to invade plunder and reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Queen Isabella invested in Christopher Columbus's exploration to increase her wealth and ultimately rejected the enslavement of Native Americans, claiming that they were Spanish subjects. Spain established an essential or contract that authorized the direct shipment of captive Africans for trade as human commodities in the Spanish colonies in the Americas. Eventually, other European nation states, the Netherlands, France, Denmark, and England, seeking similar economic and geopolitical power, joined in the trade, exchanging goods and people with leaders along the West African coast who ran self-sustaining societies known for their mineral rich land and wealth in gold and other trade goods. They competed to secure the essential and colonize the new world. With these efforts, a new form of slavery came into being. It was endorsed by the European nation states and based on race. And it resulted in the largest forced migration in the world. Some 12.5 million men, women, and children of African descent were forced into the transatlantic slave trade. The sale of their bodies and the product of their labor brought the Atlantic world into being, including colonial colonial In the colony, the colonies, status began to be defined by race and class and whether by custom, case law or status. Freedom was limited to, to maintain the enterprise of slavery and ensure power. Joining us today are two special guests, 
Mr. Nas Mayor Adedi Ron, a former director of Nigerian Museums, president of the International Council of African Museums, chief executive officer of RAA Heritage Limited, heritage and museum consultant. Thank you and welcome to our show, sir. We're happy to have you here. Our second guest today is our very own Mazi Solomon Ihedibo. It's good to have you again, <laughs> Mazi. A traditionalist and a king in the making. Thank you once again for joining us. It's always a delight to have you on the show. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. As usual, questions from the audience will be addressed at the end of the discussion. So feel free to use the raise hand option or type your questions on the chat booth, on Zoom, and of course on Facebook, and we will address it. Also know that over time on Oche Kitchen will continue with your questions even after the show has ended. And that is because we love you so. So I'm gonna jump right into it. And my first question is to Mr. Mayo Adeniron. Sir, please, can you explain the origins and workings of the African slave trade? Wow. That's a very hard one. <laughs> uh, I, I would say the origin of the African slave trade was that Africans were responding to a trade that they did not totally and fully understand. There was a current, uh, a universal current that was going on in Europe, which necessitated certain actions. The Africans went into it without cognitive recognition of what the trade was all about. Thank you. Um, something I had said while pre making preparations for the development of the Slave History Museum in Calabar, and we invited several scholars over four years to tell us the history and the very beginning of, uh, of African slavery. Okay. Yeah more importantly, the transatlantic slavery. And the essence of it was that many of the scholars as at that time could not pinpoint exactly what it was. And the reason for these are that, you know, there are parallel stories all around the world. There were parallel happenings around the world but uh, there were internal slavery already in Africa. Yes. But their response to internal, uh, to the external yes. was spontaneous because they did not have a total knowledge mm. of the ramifications yes. around the, the transatlantic slave trade. You know, even to today, the Trans-Sahara slave trade is still on. It predates huh? the transatlantic slave trade. And they borrowed some of the principles of the Trans-Sahara slavery to use also in the transatlantic slave trade. You said currently. So the origin is still a little... The, the origin is still a little bit of a mystery of how it all began. Wow. It's sad to note that um, it's still happening in some places. Yes. Okay, my second, my second question is for you, Mazi. Are you there? Yes. Okay. So the question is, why in the European mind were Africans more suitable for slavery in the new world? And what was the 
geographic distribution of slaves to the new world? Okay, first and uh, foremost, you can tell how uh, rugged and uh, strong oh. the African is. Yes, sir. Um, we stand in uh, different weathers and uh, sicknesses, diseases, and all that. But at the same time, one won't uh, throw under the carpet the roles of our fellow Africans, Nigerians, and then I will narrow it down to where I am from, hmm. the Igbo land. You know, because the question is uh, European mind, yes, because uh, if our people did not encourage and support this trade, it would not have thrived. Okay. You know, so now how did, yeah, the question is in two parts. I'm taking the first part, then I'll go to the second part. Hmm. So how did our people encourage and they support this? First, you trace it to materialism and the quest for, you say, getting some form of wealth or power or popularity. Like the previous speaker said, we were already engaged in slave trade amongst us before the transatlantic slave trade. But now, with the introduction of the transatlantic slave trade, you could tell those perpetrators were um, open to make more from, differently from what they were making from the internal slave trade. OK. So now, I'll bring in the aspect of uh, our local African traditional religion and how it contributed to the slavery, transatlantic slave trade. I don't know if any of us here know about uh, Arochuku, which is a place located in current day Abia State. And uh, they are um, shrine called the Ara Long Juju. I don't know if anybody here knows about that. Yeah, I've read about it. And the role they played <laughs> towards the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and then Mr. De Niro, I don't, do you have the knowledge of that? Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now in the entire eastern part of Nigeria, at the time in question, the Aro Longju was the strongest of all the shrines. So for arbitration, more you know, most arbitrations revolved around the land disputes and uh, a few other things. So most people from different parts of Igbo land went to um, Arolong Juju to seek redress over matters. But over time, the whole uh, idea of the Arolong Juju turned to some kind of fraud, you know, where instead of uh, doing the adjudication thing, uh, those, because it's assumed that, or uh, the, the common belief was, uh, once you are guilty, the Arolong Juju will kill you. And uh, usually, it's a, there's a long bridge over a river or whatever, where, you know, hence you get across that bridge. If you are innocent, you come back alive. But if you are guilty, the belief you don't come back. Arrow long you will kill you. So there will be blood. The, the, the river will have uh, the color of red, meaning 
this juju has slaughtered you and then but you realize that instead of these people who were claimed to have been killed they would rather butcher maybe animal or anything have the blood inside this river and then all those people who were claimed to have been found guilty will be treaded oh, to the white man yes now that is there then also in parts, some parts, parts of Igbo land, you know, the, the places where you had all the traditional rulers, Ezes and the Igwes, once you go contrary or they don't like you or anything. I think most of some of the women were equally um, um, treated. Threaded, you know, you go contrary, you know, not even that you go contrary. Maybe your husbands find something wrong or your family members find something wrong. Next thing will be You're sold. you are sold, you know. So now you can tell if our people for the cast for materialism never supported this, it wouldn't have. Then on the second part, the question of uh, the question is uh, the geographic distribution of slaves to the new world. Okay, yes, geographic distribution of you know we 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 were taught and we came to understand that most of these uh, slave slaves were shipped to the West Indies and our current day West Indies. You talk about Jamaica because at the time in question, sugarcane was like uh, the black gold yeah. of today. So they needed people who could withstand the, so you know, the whole uh, um, things associated with farming, standing it, and... And the sun too. Yeah, so that's it. That's, that's basically where most of them ended up. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, from what the, I read, the, uh, Mr. Adeniran, you could uh, prove me wrong. From what I've read, and I've seen some YouTube videos, um, they ship some to America, they ship some to Brazil. Um, they still have a Yoruba um, like um, community in, in Brazil. They ship some to Brazil, they ship, and some came back to Africa. I think they said Liberia. Yeah, and then, then the Caribbeans and stuff like and that. Syria, and Syria alone. Sorry, Syria alone, not Liberia. Syria alone, yes. thank you. I think it's Syria alone I heard. Syria no, alone, yeah. Syria thank alone. you. Thank you. Yeah, Syria alone, yeah. Thank okay. you. So um, my next question is to you, sir, Mr. Deniro. What was the Middle Passage and um, how did Africans respond to enslavement and Middle Passage? Well, uh, um, for the transatlantic uh, slave trade, you know, we, we have what we call the triangular over the Atlantic, the triangle over the Atlantic. And uh, the first voyage is that uh, ships came from England or from Europe and came to Africa, you know, with some goods for exchange of slaves and then moved slaves and spices and other agricultural produce and move them to the new world as it was called. And then agricultural produce, largely sugarcane, cotton, tobacco, and all that were shipped to Europe. So the bottom line of the triangle is the one they called most especially, they refer to as the middle passage which is from the African coast to the new world, because that's the one that involved human. Mm -hmm. The other two passages are more or less of goods. Mm. The one is the raw material. The other one is a finished product. Product, oh, so, okay. But the middle one is the one that moved, mm. is the one that moved human beings into the point of labor. And that involves several issues and several things. And it depends on 
who and who is making the interpretation or who is doing the narrative. Mm. You know, um, different kinds of ships came from Europe, largely from Liverpool, in, in England, Liverpool and Bristol supplied most of the ships higher than anywhere else. In fact, it was even stated that uh, the, the boat or ship builders even built these boats for their enemies or wow. to go out to Africa to carry uh, more slaves. And um, the inhuman nature of the transportation of people from African coast to the new world was the one that actually earned much more uh, meaning of the Middle Passage. And here there were several actions and inactions and reactions that happened along the Middle Passage. There were different kinds of cabins that were made for people, you know, which usually is about, about the height of, the length of a woman being lying prostrate and yes. maybe a maximum room of three feet high, which will allow you to move your shoulders around. No. And they arrange yeah. pe people head and legs across. Oh. which was highly inhuman and um, oh. and they arrange them in levels sometimes when somebody above defecates or urinates and all that it seeps onto the bodies below the deck so the the culture then was of great hardship to the captives and that many who had the opportunity to revolt, did revolt. Where they could not, you know, then they had to bear it. And the weak ones or the very stubborn ones were thrown overboard. You know, when there are riots and all that, they threw them overboard and some of them die that way. So the Middle Passage has its own history and has its own narrative and is a well it's a few of them have been well documented from the account of some of the ship owners or the captains of ships who kept record of what happened in their various ships on each of the voyages that they had from Africa to the New World. So largely because the bottom triangular line involved the human trafficking, that's why it was specially given the Middle Passage. The other passages were raw materials going to Europe, and the other one was finished products coming down to Africa in exchange for your human commodity. Quote and unquote. Thank you. So, Mr. Adeniro, from what I understand, they will still, they came store our raw materials, right? Then yeah, made they, them into products see, when and they then sold in, it back to us in exchange yeah, for our buy, humans. Hey. Yes, they buy <laughs> they buy a lot of our our cocoa. That's, that's our that's cocoa. Cocoa. Our that's cocoa. 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 Palm, oil. Palm, palm oil. Hold on. Palm palm oil and spices, more specifically, ivory and other agricultural produce. This was as an insurance to their investment on human being, human cargo, because they may lose some due to death, some due to sickness. And when there are many stubborn ones, they throw them overboard and they have met, I mean, put an investment on each and every one of them. So, but underneath in the bottom of the cargo, they have ivory and other forest trophies, spices, and palm oil, which they carry along. Oh, so sad. Oh, okay, Winnie, take it away. Thanks, OJ. 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, okay. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Mayo, rather, sorry. Good evening. And Mr. Solomon. Yes, good evening. Okay, my question is, um, for the people of Africa, did slavery change our customs and practices? And what impact did it have? What was lost and what was gained? Is for Mr. Solomon. Yes, my, my response will be no, it did not. Uh, or even if it did, not to a very great extent. Now, why is my response this way? If you travel to places like Jamaica, Brazil, um, Guyana, and a few other countries out there, you could tell that they have a whole lot of cultural practices which are similar to what some of us practice back home in Africa. Now, I'll give you instance pointing directly to certain practices in uh, Jamaica. Let's take it to their cuisines. I happen to have uh, a sister-in-law who is uh, Jamaican. In Jamaica, I don't know how many countries where they have palm oil. Jamaicans cook with palm oil, just like the Igbo people. Mm. Yes. I have a lot of Jamaican friends. I've never heard them say palm oil. That's cool. Palm oil, yes. Um, so Solomon, not going very far. We have a Jamaican in our midst. Ruben is here, so you can always attest to what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. Honestly, I have so much uh, to share uh, when you're ready for me, uh, but I'm not a Jamaican. My heritage is African-American. My parents are from the States. Uh, okay. But uh, I was married to a Jamaican and I was married to a Vincentian. So I have the scars of Jamaica within me, so I can certainly speak about that. Uh, but, but certainly, um, you know, so much of what you're talking about is... Um, is true. You know, what's interesting to me is uh, being a diasporic African and being a product of a slave and being a product of slavery. Uh, one of the things that, that I've, I've heard a few people talk about today, and I try to myself, is that, you know, we were not slaves, we were Africans, and exactly. they enslaved us. That's a criminal act. Exactly. And so we always tend to identify us ourselves by this criminal act. Um, but you know, I'm really heartened about the age that we've come in um, to have this ability. I mean, how many different continents are we communicating now? And each of those continents was touched by European slavery. Um, and, you know, um, I, I, I don't know, should I continue? Should I keep speaking? Or, or I don't know what the, what the point was. Um, let, let Solomon, let Solomon continue. Yeah. You'll have a chance in a future. And you can come back to me when you're ready. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Okay. So now, apart from the cuisine, certain uh, traditional practices like uh, we have uh, African traditional religion, aspects of that is also found in places like Jamaica, as I mentioned. Yes, and that's Indiana true. Guyana and uh, uh, Brazil. Like mm -hmm. in Brazil, just like practiced in the Yoruba land. I, 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 if I, if a priesthood yes. go to Brazil right now, yes. this is in practice. And then I will still um, refer us to Alex Halley's roots. Yes. So you could get some of those uh, cultural practices in these two aspects, cuisine, and uh, traditional practices, way of worship, and I think even um, in uh, in the United States, like places like uh, Louisiana, yes, you know, we are all some of some of those uh, um, voodoo, voodoo and things, yeah. uh, consultation yeah. of uh, spirits, which one might think is just a peculiar with uh, Africa, but you come to this claim. You still see it. So you can tell why I said to some extent, yes. because probably 
just I've not done any study to check the percentage, but just on my own and uh, um, the little I know, I think the percentage of those who are still abreast with some of those uh, cultures, the percentage is less compared to those who do not. So, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Ruben, can you go ahead then? Okay, thank you, Mr. Sagama. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I must say it's an honor to be here among, um, you know, such motivated and, and committed people. Uh, a little yeah. bit of background about myself. Uh, as I said, I'm a diasporic African. Um, being Black in the Americas uh, has been a, uh, an experience from birth. Uh, I was given up at birth because I was Black. Uh, my mother is white. And uh, in the town that she lived in, there were no black people or close by. And she hitchhiked from America into Canada, gave birth to me and left me here. I grew up, I never saw another black person until I was five years old. But I carried the burden of our history that was thrown onto me through the racism by the white people around me since birth. And the one thing that we cannot separate uh, our history from is the racism that has been perpetrated upon us. And now it's very true, uh, Uncle Gabe, you know, saying, and, and others have reflected that we had slavery in Africa, but we're not talking about that slavery where they got traded back and where they could marry into the community or where they became the, the royal bodyguards that kept the kings in power that happened all throughout the subregion. This is the slavery that, that we can embrace and that, that we can take um, um, all responsibility for. Um, and even in, I'm, you mentioned uh, Alex Haley, I spent 11 years in the Gambia and I'm very prepared to talk about everything about that. And, and in a way, the whole focus on Kunta Kente has taken away the real focus on Africa. I mean, it, it, you know, not to, not to get too carried away, but we must understand that we as African people, the Yoruba, the Ibu, the Fanti, the Ashanti, the Mandinka, the Wolof, the Serer, and everybody in between that contributed um, to send slaves away, to send Africans as slaves away, this was not our original intention. Yes. You, you ask about the origin of the African slave trade, the European enslavement of Africans. The story that I know, as, as, as uh, others have said, we all have our stories. But the story I know um, is pertinent to the Gambia. We believe in the Gambia that, that we were the first nation that Europeans came to take slaves, and that was 1441. Oh. Now, we know that Christopher Columbus discovered, or so-called discovered America, 1492. This is 50 years before that. Yes. And now, you, you talked about the Pope ceding uh, Africa to the Portuguese. That happened after. Yes. That happened after. They were looking for gold to support their interesting wars among themselves. This is, this is the rise of Spain. This is, you're talking the 1400s, 15th century. And there was one man who went to the Canary Islands. His name was Catamosto. And he was looking for the back route to Egypt to get gold because they didn't want to deal with the Egyptians because they didn't want to pay a fair price. So they wanted, <laughs> to, they wanted to go behind. And in the Canary Islands, they already had Africans as slaves then. These were Europeans, you know, but half Europeans, much like how the Cape Verdeans are now, they were then, okay? But they said, well, there's a place just down there. It's the largest river. Go up there. That's where all the gold comes from. Yes. They were looking for a back way to Egypt, but they found the Gambia River. They were chased out of the Gambia River by 500 men in war canoes with spears and bows and arrows, chased out. He came back a year later with another ship with Uso de Mare. And that year, 1442, they took 16 Africans back to the, the King of Spain to show them what they have. And it was decided then, it was a conscious decision then to begin to use these people to enrich themselves. Uh, pardon me one moment. I, I mentioned I'm working and my business partner just came back. So I just have to deal with him one second. Pardon me. That's okay. Um, Winnie, go ahead with your okay. second question. Okay, my second question is for Mr. Mayu. Uh, the 
for the people of the new world, that is America and the Caribbean, what impact did it have on them? That is slavery. And did they retain their culture? Mr. Mayo. Hello. He's muted. Can anybody hear me? No, he, he's muted. Okay. okay, so, Did, okay. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me now? Mr. now? Yes, yes, we can. I can hear you, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, this thing didn't happen in hiding. It happened in an open space. And uh, people acted the way they know how to act. And people lived the way they have been living before. So there was a great impact of the slaves on the people of the new world in America, in Brazil, and along all the islands of uh, the Caribbean as uh, wherever they took them to. There was a great impact also uh, at home in Nigeria based on the first question that you, and I, I've listed a few things, you know, it affected the food that we eat and yes. the food they ate. It affected dressing. It affected yes. the manner of trade yes. and it affected language. Yes. In the Yoruba land, it brought in new vocabs, vocabulary, <laughs> some faces and all that. Yeah. The advent of slavery brought so many things. And two, you should also know that the Africans that were taken into slavery, when they got there, they really enacted some of the African cultures through their memories, through the intangible aspect of our life. They were able to create other material culture as if they were at home. Yeah. And I will say specifically in the area of songs, yes. the melodies of their songs also affected the melodies of their new hosts. Sure. Especially the call and you know the choruses that we sing, you know, we have this call and and sing, you know, that there's a lead speaker that's, that leads a song and then other people follow up. Mm -hmm. And you can see mostly in African-American uh, music, you can see all of this uh, being noticeable, also in jazz and all that. Very true. Even also into the various lodges of Ekwe, which was something that was strictly within the crossover region and the Cameroons. This also extended into, into Brazil, into Cuba and Jamaica and even Florida and New York, wherever the people of this from this area were taken to. Uh, all of them were not taken to a specific location. They were distributed and shared within the, the spaces that were available. One of the reasons being to be able to cope rebellion, mutiny and all that. So they don't want people of the same locality, of the same language and of the same tribe or so, or the same group to be grouped together so that when they can easily communicate within themselves, then they can. But some cultures survive better because of partly the intangible heritage, the knowledge of their oral history, oral literature. And because many of our things were put to memory because we did not write. Only very few people could write. Oh, yes. And the signs sometimes were not easily readable, but largely it affected the culture of the new world. It affected the culture of all the Caribbeans, Brazil, know that thank you wow thank you thank you can, can i chip in informa I, I i used to wonder how come they never um remembered like none of them had african names i know they you they remember the they do. Uh, some of 
in America, I've never seen like, you know, like African Americans, you know, with like, you know, say their grandfather had like Ijoma or Ifoma or Jugos, things like that. So they do, they do. They had them silently written in their diaries and in their pocket notebooks and all that. If you have yes, had the exactly. opportunity the to watch the, the BBC Channel 4 program on The Last Slave, which was aired at the, to mark the bicentenary of the abolition of slavery. It says, uh, it, it says uh, the, last, the, the last slave, the last slave. The last slave, yeah, done by BBC Channel 4 in okay. 2000, March 2007. Which was to mark the trans, uh, the bicentenary abolition of uh, slave trade. You could see that it was from the writings of this guy's great grandparents that he knew its origin and were able to trace the villages in Igbo land where wow. uh, he actually came from. Oh, wow. So, and from the songs which the song which they sing in the various lodges is a narration of their movement into captivity. They knew where they came from and the villages they passed through. They put all of this into songs and into rhymes and all that, which they sang. And when they had the opportunity in their places of worship, they yeah. turned this into songs of their worship. But sure. it is actually a narration of the historical journey from their home place into slavery. So historians are now using all of this now to trace back the origin of some of the people who have been enslaved. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Ify. Can we, yeah, can we take a one take minute away. break, then we'll come back to the next set of questions. Thank you. Natura, Natura, Natura International. Shipping, clearing, with a difference. Natura ship to all part of the world. Part of our services are work on your behalf in searching and buying equipment, truck, cars, machinery, until they get to their final destination. Global freight forwarding, air freight and cargo, warehousing, consolidation, construction of oil and gas equipment, and display cars and trucks. For sale at a competitive prices. Natora, Natora International. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Ruben, have we got Ruben back? Is he still tied up? Hello? He was here just before the break. Yeah, all right, because my next set of questions touched. Um, touching on racism and I, I suppose why don't you, you have a lot to say about it okay. Yeah. Uh, okay all right we've got him back all right Ruben Ruben I'll ask you this question if you're ready if so he's not here go ahead go ahead he's not here no I'm here I'm here I'm here oh you're Sorry. here okay yeah, all right go ahead all right yeah all right, can you explain to us how the slave trade and slavery contributed to the growth of the idea of race and racism? I know you were talking a bit about racism earlier on. Racism. Do you want to throw more light on it? Certainly. Um, you know, we have, to, we have to put ourselves in the context of the origin. So whatever the origin is, we know it was around the 15th century. Um, what was happening in the 15th century? Europe was at odds. Um, the old empires were growing. The Moors had just um, declined in Spain. So it's not like Europe didn't have a history with us um, because during the, the Moorish um, um, time in Andalusia, there were Africans there in high places. Not, the Europeans cannot say that they thought the Africans were less than them because they saw us always as their equals. But they were fighting against um, a dark future in Europe. And so the end of the Moorish times was a time of racism. It was a time of Europeans. 
They wanted it for themselves. And it was a, it was a time of greed. So it was with that greed and that they came down and descended on us. What they had, the only thing they had that we didn't have was the technology of weapons. Everything else that they had, we the had- gunpowder. Well, if swords, swords even at that time and gunpowder and ships of war, they had technology and they, instead of using that technology for the global growth, we see even today with the COVID-19 vaccine, the United States is um, hoarding everything. This was their same mentality back then. Um, the enslavement of Africans from the 15th century has always been about to degrade us. They knew that our societies were even more advanced than theirs even those ones that came into the Gambia in 1441. If you look how a normal Portuguese peasant lived, and then you look at how a Mandinka lived, who is, who's more healthy, uh, who has a better family structure, they knew what they were doing. Mandinka. But for them, it was only about greed. We don't, yes. have look, we don't have to look far. Even in our modern day society, we have the cocaine, Cocaine and slavery are, are basically the same. Yes, one, one was a human product, the other one is a drug. But it's the same thing like when we talked about um, how we as Africans, how we embrace slavery in ourselves. Okay, are we, the, are we the perpetrators of this slavery? They want us to join with their racism and their racist genocide, but it's not the same. It's the, it's the same as saying the coca farmers in Peru are the same as the drug barons and the people in the United States who are making uh, cocaine available. We were part of a trade system that was not part of our uh, internal economy. Um, it was not part of any of that. They introduced racism to us. Uh, all throughout history, you can see that whenever a foreign people came to Africa, we were welcoming. Now, I mentioned about the 500 war canoes chasing Catamosto out of the river. I would probably tell you that they had heard about these white people. And yeah. they knew. Mm -hmm. Years later, when they came back to uh, the Gambia and they wanted the gold and they found the gold in Mali, they found it was there. They used to travel up country. We trusted them so little that we would never meet them face to face. We would give them a point where they would come and they would put all their trade goods down. They'd walk two miles away, two, two days away from that and wait a day. Then they'd come back. Beside that, we would put gold. If they, if they thought the gold was enough, they would take the gold, leave the goods. If they didn't think the gold was enough, they'd leave both. So the Africans would have a chance to put more gold if they wanted to up the deal. And if the Africans said, no, I don't want it, the gold would be gone. We didn't even want to deal with them. So we can't let anybody tell us that we were chasing them. You know, we also have to take into the expedient that when Africans finally got involved with the trade, and, and you can find this out specifically about the Gambia. There is a, it's an online story by a guy by the name of Francis Moore, M-O-O-R-E. And he was an accountant on James Island, which is now Kunta Kente Island, in the Gambia at the same time that Kunta Kente was supposed to be taken in the 1740s, 1750s. And he shows you the, the logical understanding business that slavery was. It wasn't the pariah that we want to make it. To we Africans, yes, it was a genocide. But to society, no, nothing has changed. Yes. The Donald Trumps of today were the slave drivers of the of the of the issue three four hundred years ago lloyds of london you know you look at the uh reparations movement that is going on which i fully support but you know we as africans we have to deal with this slavery issue in the gambia almost a hundred percent of their tourism thrust is about kunta kente and the slave trade but what's the name of the king What's the name of the last king? 
um, uncle, you know, and, and people have been saying how we in the West, yes, we have some vestiges of our African culture. But I, I can tell you, after 11 years in the Gambia, and I had the tremendous opportunity and privilege to serve the Oni of Ife. Oh, so wow. If you, want to, if you want to talk about culture in Africa, there is no place that you have to go anywhere else than Ile Ife. And how, how the traditional Yoruba and even Ibu and Hausa culture today in Nigeria are, are one yes. with, with the society and even the government is a testament for the rest of the world. You will not find this anywhere else. You, in the Gambia, our culture there has been um, a little bit subverted by religion. So now uh, you're only really, you're Mandinka, but you're really a Muslim or a Christian. Yes. In Nigeria, it's a bit different. You found a way to be both and, and everything at one, and, and I admire that. Um, you know, I think one of the points I'd like to uh, introduce here, and then I'll stop talking, is, is about what's next. And, and I think that um, me being with you um, is also indicative of what's next because in the West, uh, we're realizing, you know, J January 6, 2021 um, was a wake up call for a lot of people. Yes. But for those of us like, like myself, I was part of the Million Man March with Eric in 1995, where we put 1.5 million black men in Washington, D.C., with honor and dignity and stood up. And yet, mm -hmm. Treated us mm -hmm. as pariahs. Okay. Um, nobody wants to remember the greatness of who we are in the West and what we do. It doesn't matter. Okay. People, you can say, you know, Martin, people want to go back to Martin Luther King. They shot Martin Luther King, they shot Malcolm X. So in the next hundred years, there's going to be a flow. I was only part of the beginning which started from Marcus Garvey in the 20s about the Back to Africa movement. Um, you know, we have to get control of this understanding of slavery. There was more that went on in that period. So from, from 1442 to 1900, even as uncle said today, even still the Trans-Saharan trade is going on. What else, what, what else is there? I think that we need to change the dynamic and, and take ownership for what is ours. During the transatlantic slave trade, Africa contributed to the global economy one third. Mm. One third, just like uncle was saying about the triangular trade. So you took humans from Africa, but they produced everything in the West that went to Europe. Now, I also, I want to just throw one thing out uh, about the people who were enslaved, that the demographic of those people changed several times throughout history. Yes. And in the last 250 years, the majority of the slaves of the Africans taken from Africa were below the age of 21. Everybody, everybody pr present here, all of the gray beards like me, all of the, the, the women who've already had children, they would have killed you and left you for the vultures on the side of the road. You were not. And so you wonder why we don't have more of our history because we were taken as children. We didn't understand it. And then you can imagine the emotional genocide that happened. You know, the characterization of the slave ship that I heard earlier today is a candy coating. Yes. The French, who had the largest slave ships in the world, there was one slave ship called the Black Angel, Loage, mm -hmm. uh, Loire, uh, Le Noir Lange. That one particular ship carried 2,700 Africans in its bowels. They had dysentery, they had seasickness, the, they were not cleaned, or if they were cleaned, they were cleaned inhuman. We don't want to talk about the rapes. We don't want to talk about the, the summary executions. Mm. You know, there's the, this is a, a very interesting topic that has a lot of hurt, but also I think there's a lot of growth. Um, this very ugly yeah. 
safety before you. Uh, I sitting in front of the only one time. And uh, um, I was talking to him and, and I mentioned, I said, you know, your majesty, I'm not a continental African and I'm not a Yoruba. And he stopped me. The only of Ife stopped me. And he says, Reuben, how do you know? He said, all you know, we could be cousins. The only difference between you and I is that I was never taken. And so that spirit coming from Africa's foremost monarch to a diasporic former slave is I think a, um, a role model for what we are doing here is that it's healing yes. and it's beginning to see what is next. Calabar, Port Harcourt, um, Elmina Castle, uh, Jufre and Albreda, um, Dakar, Gori Island, all of these places, the Europeans made them the gates of hell, but we will transform them into the gates back home. Mm. And so I, I really think it's important that we embrace this topic, but we look at it from a real holistic point of view, that we know that we've lost something. It was a coup d'etat. They, they cut the head of our culture off. But now we have the ability to come back together um, to regrow that head and to regrow it without that absence that we had before. Yeah, I think you're right. I yeah. think you're right, Ruben. We have to have uh, we have to schedule another show, and, and we hope you come back and we'll talk about it from um, a holistic part of from what you're saying. Um, Sageb, your hand is up. Do you want to say anything? Hi, Ruben. Hi, guys. Am I on? Yeah, yeah we, can hear you. we can hear you. Glad to have you back. The old check, the old check kitchen team, um, you guys are wonderful. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New Year again. <laughs> Happy New Year again to everyone there. Pretty ladies and great guys. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you for saying yes to this outing for knowledge. Yes, and then I, I must commend Ruben for saying yes. I've been trying to nudge Ruben in the last two days. He's oh. so <laughs> and he responded, and then I, I can't thank him enough. There's someone who is watching and listening, even though he has another program going on, yeah. Mr. Tim McPherson. He's from the Maroons community of uh, Achampong in Jamaica. Okay. He's listening to us. I'm sure maybe some other time he will come online because he's combining this with another one. Um, if, he Ruben, has, if he wants to say something, he can. We have like four or five minutes. Like, it's five five minutes. Minutes there. So maybe after this, you hey, can. I like your outfit. Thank you. <laughs> Good. So Ruben, Ruben, I, I wanted to remind you. Come on, about about your husband. <laughs> thank you so much, my dear brother Gabe. It's, it's great Good. to see you again. And thank you Good. for having Good. me. Good. Fortunately, I missed out on most of the discussion as I was having another conference, which actually everybody in this current conference should have been there as Good. we made some important decrees. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Chief Samako Timothy McPherson. I am the Minister of Finance for Akampong, Jamaica. I am also the Marine Secretariat for the island of Jamaica. I'm the creator of a very controversial indigenous currency called the Lumi, which most of you would have heard as it has been adopted by the Pan-African Kingdoms Federation and Embo Kingdom and other kingdoms mm -hmm. across the continent as its official currency. And I'm also the chairman for the economic community of the African diaspora six region. The discussion that you are having tonight on slavery is crucial. And unfortunately, I've, I've missed it. But let me just say this, a discussion on slavery is meaningless without a parallel discussion on the transformation of how we are moving forward as a people. And the two topics go hand in hand. When I created mm. the bank in Akampong, and when we aligned ourselves with Embo Kingdom and Pan-African Kingdoms Federation to issue the stimulus, 
Many people were trying to understand the logic of that. They said, hold on, the Maroons are just a traditional kingdom. And I said, hold on a second. No, no, no. You don't call the Queen of England a traditional kingdom. We are not static. We are not frozen in time. So yes, we've gone through a major psychological, emotional, ancestral tragedy, but we must keep it in its historical context with a view towards where we are going in the future. And in that future, Africa ceases to be tail and it becomes head again, as we always have been. And so I thank Gabe Ona very much for inviting me to this auspicious group. I know that um, you, you would appreciate the legacy of the Maroons of Jamaica as being the oldest sovereign African territory in the Western Hemisphere, having been established in 1739 in terms of our diplomatic relations with Britain when we forced them to sign a peace treaty after defeating them at war, but having always been sovereign in our territories. And it is appropriate that the Maroon territories of Jamaica today has become the official headquarters for the African diaspora. So in the same way that Addis Ababa is headquarters for the AU, this legacy of our ancestors has allowed us to be rightfully so and vindicatively so headquarters for the diaspora sixth region. We just made about 15 oh. minutes ago a very important decree that I would like to share with you all. We will with immediate effect be establishing a Royal Academy Pan-African Health Organization. Wow. Which is being uh, uh, for, for health and medicine which is being hmm. structured specifically for the purposes of giving preliminary assessment and review of any and every medication that comes on to continental Africa in the context of a, in the, with the name of a vaccine. We will be engaged in immediate effect, the African Union, to make it abundantly hmm. clear that this thing called agenda 2063 is about Africa and the diaspora working together and that the diaspora will not have its voice silenced. So Amen. we will make decrees and we will impose ourselves on the African Union, whether they like our decrees or not, because we are well aware that something called Stockholm Syndrome exists and some people are still in love with their colonial masters. <laughs> and so, I say all of that only to come back to my starting point. Yeah. As we talk about history, mm. as you talk about uh, Gore Island in Senegal, as you talk about all those, you know, those places that our ancestors went through, those doors, those channels, we must also talk about the future forward. And one of the key frameworks that we are articulating and imposing, and we've already engaged the European Union on this topic, in addition to the elimination of the debt, which we don't have, but in any case, which we will address, um, we've made it abundantly clear that as the economic community of the sixth region begins to consolidate the diaspora, in the same way that we left the continent through a very narrow door of no return, so shall it be as it relates to Western goods going back onto the continent under this new era of the African continental free trade area. Okay. That the diaspora must be the door in which traded goods are first vetted by the diaspora for African continent. If it's coming from the UK, we have diaspora in the UK. So if you want to see diaspora contribution. If it's coming from America, we have enough diaspora in America. If it's coming from Canada, we have diaspora in Canada. If it's coming from China, by the way, we have diaspora in China. And so only, and I will, I will stop 
with what I began with, only to put balance on the conversation. The Maroons mm. of Jamaica are the first of the African family to hold political sovereignty. And now as the African family begins to fight for economic autonomy, we've put forth our sovereign currency with no strings attached. Wow, currency? Or the Ooh. World Bank or any other such institution. Mm. And so we now take the narrative of slavery. You know they had roots part one, roots part two. Well, this is the ultimate next generation. And so we must always balance our slavery discussion Thank you. with our ways forward. Thank you so much, Dave for having me here. And a wonderful blessings to you all this time. Thank you. Thank you, Chief and Thank Ruben. You. And Zagib. Can you guys um stick around? We have um over time on Oche Kitchen. I'm sure some people have we have questions to ask you guys. Please. Okay, sure. you know, go ahead, end the show and then we'll continue. Okay, um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, yeah. Good, thank you for joining us. Um, we are happy to have all of you and our special guests, especially those who responded on very, very short notice. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, let me just pick one comment and we'll end the show and go to over time. Someone said that I was said, if we can learn from the past, heal, grow, and we'll, we will be a better people. As simple as that, we'll have to try and put it behind us and move on and move, move on. on for real. Um, it hurts, it's sad, mm -hmm. it's sickening. Someone said it is, yeah, genuinely. And again, Oche Kitchen, I'll show you, before we go over to overtime, I'll show you what we've got next week. So at least you know. When it gets lonely, that oh, and lonely, it may be depression. Fight anxiety. Remember, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Join Ocha Kitchen Discussion live on Facebook via Zoom on Saturday, January 23rd, 2021. Time, 8 p.m. Nigerian time, 7 p.m. UK time, 2 p.m. East Standard time, 1 p.m. Central Standard time, and 12 p.m. Pacific time. Be a part of this interesting discussion. See you there. So sit back for the time. All right. Um, OJ, do you want to throw the question? Um, we did not hear the question. Very first question here is from... I think Adibeli was talking to Mr. Deniro. Is he still here? Yes, Mr. Deniro is here. Okay. Um, she said. Yes, I'm say, here. Okay, thank you, sir. When you say currently transatlantic slavery, sir, please, what do you mean? How is it done? Give us a typical example. A typical example of transatlantic slave trade? Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> I don't know how best to. <laughs> I think I think the easiest thing is saying shipping um Africans to across the Atlantic Ocean, the yeah, Trans-Sahara carried... amongst Africa to Africa, right? That's the Trans-Sahara. Yeah. Yeah, because when you said it, I got a little confused. Like you know the way he said Trans-Sahara Trans. -Sahara, trans then I got it, yeah, so. No, I the one that ask, moves through the desert, ask, the one that moves from Africa to the Middle East in particular, mm. to north of Africa and then to the Middle East is a Trans-Sahara uh, slave trade, which is still on to today, actively. Uh, but the Transatlantic is the one that went through the Atlantic Ocean. Yes. So I need to add something from the origin that the origin, which I said, is a history which Africa